Okay, so let's kick off. Um, my pleasure, Phil. Um, so, uh, my name's Sophie Castell. I am the uh, Chief Exec here at Myeloma UK. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this online digital event um, as part of our celebration of our 25th anniversary. Um, so just as we were just saying, um, the, this event is being recorded and it will be available to watch later on our Facebook page and on our website. Um, so if there's anyone who you know who wanted to be here this evening and couldn't be here, then uh, the recording will be made available. So we've got a really, truly amazing lineup for you this evening. Um, you're going to hear about some of our key achievements to date and help us celebrate those. But more importantly than that, we're going to be looking beyond and looking forward. We've got a panel of really leading speakers who are going to talk to us about their ambitions and their hopes for myeloma treatment in the future and what could make the biggest impact for myeloma patients as we look forward to the next 10 and 20 years. Um, and you're going to be invited to join in that conversation too. We're going to be having a couple of live polls during the event. Um, assuming the technology works, that's always a slightly dodgy one, but I think that will be um, good to hear people's views on the, on the call. Um, and then you will be able to submit um, questions later on to our great speakers um, as part of the Q&A. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can throughout the course of the evening. So to kick us off, I thought I'd just take you back 25 years. We're celebrating 25 years of Myeloma UK. So what was happening a quarter of a century ago? Well, Tony Blair's new Labour had just been elected to office. Titanic, remember that film, was taking the box office by storm. And the Spice Girls were topping the charts. So that dates me, certainly. Um, and in that year, Myeloma UK was also being born. And a lot has changed in that 25 years. Um, for everybody, but it's especially true, I think, for myeloma patients. When we opened our doors, the world was a very, very different place for someone newly diagnosed with myeloma. When we started, the average life expectancy for a myeloma patient was between 12 to 24 months, and there were no bespoke treatments, no cl clinical guidelines or treatment or guidelines on diagnosis, and there was no organisation to support myeloma patients. But today it is a very, very different story. And to give you a sense of the changes that have happened over these last 25 years, we've got a short video to share with you. So that was just a little video showcase of some of the key achievements that we've made together across the myeloma community in the last 25 years. Um, and we've also created an interac uh, interactive timeline where you can look back at some of the amazing milestones that we've reached together. And I think that link is being posted in the chat now for you to take a look at later on. So I joined the charity as chief exec earlier this year in May. And I've been amazed by so many things about this organization, but particularly about the progress we've made. And I thought I'd share with you sort of three things that particularly stood out to me 
as we were looking back and, and reflecting on that quarter of a century. The first thing was the role that we played in getting the first myeloma drug, um, Velcade, approved for use on the NHS. It was initially rejected, but we didn't take no for an answer and we fought back, the community fought back. Um, staff joined forces with those dauntless activists from those early days, the Bell Cave Three, Janice Rigglesworth, Jackie Pickles, and Marie Morton. Um, and there are just some amazing images of them standing outside Parliament, brandishing placards, um, and vigorously really defending um, patients' right to, pre to treatment. Um, that, that, the approval of that in 2007 was a massive step forward for thousands of patients. And we are still continuing to fight to get drugs approved. And now there are nine myeloma drugs in active use that can be delivered in 12 different combinations throughout the patient's journey. So that's you know, one of the, the major achievements of the last quarter century. The second role that has really impressed me is the role that we in the community have made throughout our support services. So our info line has answered almost 60,000 calls since it began. We sent out over 2 million publications and hosted more than 200 info days. You know, 25 years ago, finding reliable, up-to-date and accurate information about myeloma was incredibly difficult. Um, but today, that information is available and, you know, we will do everything we can to make sure that people have the information they need at every stage of their journey. And finally, um, I think I've been really impressed just on what we've done in that research space. We've invested over 19 million into scientific research and we continue to invest in strategic research to drive innovation and in diagnosis, treatments and clinical trial design for myeloma. Um, you know, just this year we launched uh, research into early diagnosis um, with two new research grants um, and I was uh, very uh, pleased last week at a conference to, to meet um, some of the researchers that we are funding and some of their students, which is a lovely thing to be able to do. And of course, none of this would be possible without you, our donors, our volunteers, our supporters, as well as our clinical and industry partners. So thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this journey. And together we are transforming people's lives and making a real difference for myeloma patients and their families. So that's all great, you know, good stuff. But there is more work to be done. We cannot rest on our laurels. There are still challenges, and I'm sure they are the very real challenges that you are all aware of. Myeloma patients still experience some of the longest times to diagnosis of any cancer, um, and the impact of that delayed diagnosis is often overlooked. Our own research demonstrated very clearly what a delayed diagnosis has and the impact it has on the quality of life of myeloma patients. And we also know that treatments for myeloma can be incredibly tough. And now people are living longer with that visit with the disease. It's an even tougher job to make sure that they continue to live well. So as we reflect, yes, on the successes of the last 25 years, we also want to look forward and look at what the future could hold. You know, what could we do with the time and money that we can invest? What would make the biggest difference to patients in the next five, 10 or 25 years? And tonight is the start of that conversation for all of us, for all of us in the myeloma community to start thinking about what those, that difference could be. Um, and so tonight, uh, we want you to be part of that conversation. And I guess we want to do two things. We want to leave you inspired about what we've achieved so far, but also start a fire, a little fire to think about what could we do in the future um, if we combine the ambition that we all have when the, with the investment that we are um, able to make? So with that, I want to introduce our first um, polling question to you this evening. Um, so a lot has changed in the last 25 years as we've been discussing. Um, and so we'd like you to sort of just take a look at what you can see on screen, screen and vote. What do you think has made the biggest impact since Myeloma UK started? And you've got various options there. We've got access to treatments, we've got funding, access to information, improvements, um, raising awareness of myeloma. 
and oh, and I can see this is exciting. I can I can see this coming up on my screen. I'm not sure you can all see that. So at the moment, we've got access to more treatment options is leading the way with about 70%. Funding is the next one down. Um, we've got what else? Improvements in early diagnosis. So that's looking really good. Yeah, I think consensus here is access to treatment options seems to be the thing that you all feel has made the most difference. That's looking really good. Yeah, actually, that's way out in the lead now. So 70 percent there funding coming in the next but at 10 percent. So that's a very, very, very clear result, I think, for the what has made the single greatest impact. So what do you reckon? That's looking fairly stable. I think has everyone voted. Right, tech wizard in the background. Are we going to end that poll, do you think? You, sh you shouldn't trust me to do it. <laughs> right, there we go. People sharing, sharing the results here. So you can see um, access to more treatment options has come out top of our poll. Um, and I have to say, I think that, that, that doesn't surprise me in many ways. I do think um, that's been the biggest treatment. If you think about the fact there were no bespoke treatments, and now we've got nine treatments, 12 different combos. Um, so I think, yeah, a great endorsement uh, to that great, great improvement in, in um, treatment options. So thank you. OK, I think we can probably take the poll down there. Is that what's happening now? I have to be led by the technology wizards here. Yeah, OK, we, that's it. It's all looking very good. Brilliant. OK, so. Having had that um, look um, at uh, what, uh, what we've done uh, in the past, um, what we now want to do is move forward into um, looking at the future. Um, and we've got um, some really great panellists joining us today to give you um, their view on what they think the potential and the possibilities are for the future. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, I just want to mention, if you've got any questions, please do put them into the Q&A box. Um, but we'll wait until everyone has spoken, so until we've heard from all of the panellists, um, until we get to the questions. So as they are giving their talks, please do feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box um, rather than the, the chat. So to share their thoughts on the future of myeloma treatment, let's turn to our panel. And I'm really delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Graham Jackson. I'm sure a lot of you know Graham. He's a consultant haematologist at Newcastle Hospitals Foundation Trust and is a professor of clinical haematology at Newcastle University. Um, his research interests focus on clinical trials and safety in the treatment of myeloma. And he's been a chief in investigator on the MRC Myeloma 9, 11, 11 plus trials and is currently the co-chief investigator for Myeloma 14. He's part of the safety monitoring committee for all of the uh, Myeloma UK trials, as well as several international studies. And I believe he's going to kick us off by talking about early diagnosis. Over to you, Graham. Thank you very much. And it's uh, <clears throat> been a huge pleasure, firstly, to work with the organisation as a myeloma physician I see the benefits that Myeloma UK bring to my patients each and every day, whether it's through info days, through the nurses information line, or all of the multiple things that Myeloma UK do every day to help our patients. So for me, one of the things I think is still a, a big issue is early diagnosis. I know noticed some people on the poll have voted for that. I'm sure many of the people that are taking part in tonight's webinar uh, we'll know uh, of the delays that patients still experience in the diagnosis of multiple myeloma and the frustration that they've been going to their GP for a number of visits and, and the diagnosis takes a while to make. And as Sophie said, importantly, myeloma is still the cancer that takes the longest time from first symptoms of the disease to being diagnosed. It's one of the hardest diagnoses to make. Now, to be fair, there's good reasons for that. It doesn't present as a lump or a bleeding issue or difficulties in passing urine or bleeding from the bowel. It doesn't have an obvious symptom that makes people think, ah, it's myeloma, because the symptoms of multiple myeloma are often vague. There may be back pain, 
fatigue, aches and pains in other bones, or repeated infections. And sadly, those symptoms are very common in general practice. And it's been estimated, for instance, that a GP would have to see a thousand patients uh, with back pain before they saw one patient with multiple myeloma. But nevertheless, we have a dilemma because 50% of our patients will make three or more visits to the GP before the diagnosis is made, and that's more than any other cancer. And importantly, and we'll hear, and we've, we've already talked about many of the improvements we've made in the treatment of multiple myeloma, but there's no doubt that the myeloma patient at diagnosis, we want those patients to have no complications. And the longer the diagnosis is delayed, the more likely they are to have bone problems, the more likely they are to have kidney problems. And, and we really strongly believe if we can get patients earlier before myeloma has caused any damage to the bones or kidneys, that patients will have a better quality of life and will really be able to benefit from the many, many improvements we're seeing in treatment. Delays also possibly make the disease more advanced. So we want to get it earlier before the disease is more advanced. And interestingly, it's been said that after attending a GP practice, it's still 108 days from, on average, patient first going to the GP and being diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So for me, the big thing we've got to do in the next 25 years is get that diagnosis earlier. And I think we have to think about screening uh, for myeloma because actually the blood tests for this disease are very easy to do. We are seeing a huge population-based study in Iceland called the I-STOP study where they're screening or trying to screen as many of the adult population as possible. Uh, for myeloma. And some of that study will really help, I think, inform us as to how we best identify patients where we can make the diagnosis more quickly. And that, for me, is a key thing we have to really work on in the next few years. Unmute myself. Thank you, Graham. That was really helpful, and I'm sure we may have some questions coming up about the the ice stop study later in the in the session. Um, so now we're going to I'm going to introduce you to our second speaker. Um, so we have uh, online with us today, Dr. Dr. Martin Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is a clinical psycho, um, scientist and honorary consultant hematologist at the Institute of Cancer Research and the Royal Marsden. He was also announced as the first Jacqueline Forbes Nixon Research Fellow by the David Forbes Nixon Charitable Foundation. So, Martin, over to you. And Martin is going to share his thoughts on the future of personalised medicine. Yes, thank you very much, Sophie. And I, um, it's, it's an honour, you know, both to speak here and to speak after Graham Jackson, which is always enlightening. And I share his joy entirely in terms of having worked with myeloma for multiple years now on several projects, including research projects that have been really very, very fruitful, aligned, for example, to the trials that uh, Graham has been leading on and that have brought a lot of insights uh, that are really of practical use. And I think this is where I want to um, really take the conversa conversation a bit because I share absolutely the the uh, thought with Graham that and the clear um, um, knowledge that we are seeing lots of patients still being diagnosed too late. I think it is a, a very, very interesting study that's being run in Iceland and we will learn a lot from that. Uh, I think what we all feel, unfortunately, of course, is that there should be ideally better access by primary care for screening, uh, especially with imaging as well. And I think that is a very difficult task to shoulder. I think where the personalization of care and where I want to make the point is, even if we screen patients or with the patients that we diagnose already, we will still see that every patient is different. And if a patient is diagnosed, there are very, very clear questions any one of us would have in that situation. It would be questions that would be, what type of, do I need treatment at this point? What type of treatment do I need? And because myeloma has been such a treatment success with new therapies coming on, 
of course, this disease in some patients has become more of a chronic disease where other questions then come up. How long do I need the treatment for? What intensity? How many drugs? What combinations do I need? And I think this is where personalization of therapy and, and care really comes in. And that's one of the areas of interest that, that I really have in terms of understanding both the disease uh, and uh, that can be through the way of genetics of the tumor, but we're learning over the coming years probably more and more about the immune system as well, how much that plays a role. With lots of new immunotherapies coming on, it will probably be uh, at, at, at an even keel with genetics, um, which will still play a role. And we have already seen that some treatments are particularly active, for example, in genetic subgroups. Um, such as venetoclax, which unfortunately we still don't have access to, probably because of an underfunding of personalization of care. So I think personalization is a key for hopefully us understanding as physicians what we can recommend to patients, to patients also having more information about making decisions on their own uh, about if we can present, you know, it is risky to stop a therapy. Um, then you know, that might be an argument against it. Whereas if we can, with the information that we have, say uh, that maybe a treatment break is somewhat uh, you know, within limits, uh, potentially safe, that could be probably helpful. Now, we're not entirely there. There is more research needed in this area, but I think we have made huge progress most recently through a trial that we ran with Myelom UK, especially targeting high-risk patients with disease that is aggressive and that we diagnosed very early with new diagnostics that are not available in the NHS at the moment. But the outcomes of this trial are really positive in terms of intensifying therapy, uh, again, with treatments that we don't have access yet on the NHS. We will show the updated results of that at the end of the year conference, the ASH conference. And we will, of course, try with Myelom UK to work on making these things accessible. But I think it's a very first important step towards uh, not only knowing about the disease more, but probably also being able to uh, make a case for uh, uh, new treatments or, or specific treatments for specific subpopulations populations of patients. And I think that's the way forward because we were going to be asked that as well from the healthcare system to actually say whether certain treatments that might be uh, uh, difficult to get onto the NHS, maybe subgroups of patients might benefit particularly from that. So that's actually the idea of personalization of care. There are many different nuances to it. And I think in the end, it will work really well with early diagnosis as well, because if we diagnose more people, we will not want to know particularly who do we have to follow up very closely, who uh, actually do we need to probably start treatment even early on. And personalization of care is, of course, a very, very important element in all of that. So very happy to discuss. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, so we've had two very interesting perspectives here, the importance of continued importance of early diagnosis and perhaps looking at screening, and then how do we get more personalization into care. The last um, speaker um, I'd like to introduce you to is Sheila McKinley, um, who is the Director of Research and Advocacy at Marlow UK. So she was going to be joined by Mark Davis, um, but unfortunately, he is not able to join us. He's had some tech issues. Um, so he was going to give us a very direct patient perspective on some of these issues. Um, but anyway, I'm going to um, introduce Sheila, um, and she will be our final speaker on the panel this evening. Um, so Sheila, as I said, is our Director of Research and Advocacy. So she is the person that makes sure that we do get equal access to the latest and most effective treatments. Um, and a lot of the work that we do um, in that and that space is, is, led, is led by um, Sheila. So whether it's to do with COVID vaccinations, antivirals, um, new treatments coming through and being licensed via NICE, um, Sheila makes sure that patient voices are heard in, those proce in, in, in that process. Um, so Sheila, I'm gonna hand over to you and um, you're gonna share your thoughts on the future of patient voice and patient choice in myeloma treatment. Thanks, Sophie. Yes, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. It's wonderful to look back and see how far we've come over the past 25 years. But as you can see from all the comments people are leaving in the chat, we do have a very long way to go. And I think this is a pivotal moment for us 
in myeloma treatment and care. And because of that, I want to really emphasize to people tonight that Myeloma UK is not an organization that has ever rested on its laurels and it's not about to start now. We are ambitious and we want to do the best for patients. And I think we're actually at a point where almost because we've come so far and we do have a treatment pathway that is unrecognizable from what it was 10 years ago, we actually need to redouble our efforts because as well as investing in research for a cure, as well as campaigning for new treatments to be made available, we almost for the first time have the space and the imperative to really, really focus on how people with myeloma are living their lives, on their quality of life. Thankfully, myeloma patients are living longer and longer and therefore quality of life becomes arguably even more important. So as we look to the future in Myeloma UK, we have got to amplify that patient voice, which is about pressing for those bespoke treatments that Martin was talking about, making sure that we match up diagnostics with treatments so the patients get the best treatment that will work for them, trying to find tailored treatments for people who are challenged by, for example, having high risk myeloma, we want to get better at treating the complications that people are living with as a result of myeloma. And we want just as effective and more effective, but also kinder treatments so that patients are not living with the painful legacy of peripheral neuropathy or having to cope with the roller coaster of a steroid regimen like dexamethasone. So what we are still here to do is to support patients and to help them live not just longer, but to do everything we can to help them to do all the things they love to do and then make our lives unique and worthwhile. And that was going to be my link into, into introducing Mark, who I'm very, very sorry can't come here this evening. And he actually was on the call to begin with. So what I wanted to do was to try and help you understand what Mark might have said and through me to do my best to kind of um, enable Mark to speak. So Mark is an amazing guy who has a very busy full-time job. He is a writer and a consultant. He is a dad. He is a football fan. He is a Mid Middlesbrough fan. I'm not going to make any jokes about whether that's football. He is a bad guitarist. He was diagnosed not that long ago and has undergone a stem cell transplant. And while we were waiting, I actually did a bit of Googling and I have come across a blog that Mark has written. If any of you are on Twitter, you can follow Mark on Twitter at MarkDavis67. And I thought I would just read you a, a little bit of the last entry that Mark put in his blog. And he's talking about when he went on a recent holiday to Norway, and this is how it begins. He says, I was chatting to the guide as we prepared to say farewell after three sodden but glorious days, kayaking, camping, and hiking in a beautiful Norwegian fjord. Stem cell, you said, the guide asked, because I'd felt compelled to warn him at the outset of our trip that my immune system isn't what it was. A year ago, almost to the day, I hobbled out of hospital on a walking stick after the transplant, which has given me a second life. We talked about how far medical science had come in the last two decades and how incredibly kind it's been to people like me. Those of us who are suddenly hitting a life bump in the form of myeloma, he was right. I might have made it 20 years ago, but the prognosis would not have been so great. And 40 years ago, I might have had very little chance. But these days, with new strides being made every year, I've been given privileged access to that precious thing called hope. We tried to hike the next day, but the rain was like nothing I've ever seen before. And that night it was Devon's curry in a hurry for dinner. Norway is as beautiful as I expected it to be, overwhelming but in a deeply comforting way. As we left, Devon urged me to keep pushing on with my outdoor adventures. Amazing man, he said as we fist bump. 
But here's the thing, not amazing. Amazing is the word for the scientists, the consultants and the nurses who can take my body and give it a new life so that it feels something akin to what it was before. The gift of a second life is many things, but one of the most wonderful things is the way I've been given the chance to worry about normal things again. And of course, to experience new adventures with my wonderful family. So I hope that gives you a sense of who Mark is as a patient. Um, and Mark and I did an event earlier this year we're becoming a bit like the two Ronnies or Morecambe and Wise or something. And the final thing I wanted to leave you with is the very kind things that Mark did say about Myeloma UK and also about the community that he was able to reach out to through Myeloma UK. And he talked in that about the fact that patients have to be right at the heart of advocating, developing and campaigning. And he also talked about the fundamental importance of support and fellowship and that Myeloma UK is at the centre of all of that for him. So in his absence, I want to say thank you to Mark for speaking so eloquently, both in his blog and previously in person, and to say thank you for the support that he's given us as, as, as an organisation. And what he shares with so many patients is that he does share his experience with us, he does share his insight with us, and that is a tremendous privilege for which we will always be very grateful and which we intend to put to very good use to improve treatment and care. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to, to Mark in, in your absence, <laughs> in his absence. Um, so that um, wraps up our initial uh, chats from our panelists. Um, and in a while, you're gonna get an opportunity to uh, grill them a little further, ask them some questions. Um, however, um, what we're going to do now is give you another opportunity um, to uh, get your voice heard through another poll. So what we asked you before was what had made the most impact. What we're now asking you is what do you think is going to have the greatest impact in the future? Thinking a bit about the, the, um, uh, the talks that you've just heard. Um, so personalised medicine, access to new treatments, early diagnosis. I saw some things in the chat with people saying how important they felt that would, would continue to be. So, oh, now this is interesting because this is a lot more split. What's in the, oh, at the moment we've got, oh, it's a, it's a neck and neck race between personalized medicine and accessibility to new treatments with early diagnosis coming up fast on the inside. That's looking good. Very interesting. So as a group, you were very clear what had worked in the past. You're a lot more split in terms of what the future looks like. That's really interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. OK. Are we oh, a few more people still voting? A few more people. OK, let's end that poll and see if we can share the results. Oh. Are we okay? Tech wizards are going to have to let me know if people can see the results there. But it looks like personalized medicine has just won out 40%, new treatments 33%, improvements in early diagnosis 20 and then we've got funding and um, patient choice and voice. So that's a really interesting result for that poll. Really interesting. Okay. So what I want to do now is move us on into, if anyone's got any comments on those results, then do put them into the chat. It'd be lovely to see it. Um, so what I want us to do now is move into our speaker um, Q&A uh, session. So I think you'll be able to see everybody on screen. And I can still see the poll. Is that meant to have come down? Not quite sure what's happening there. Okay, I'm gonna take there we go. Um, so um, what we're gonna do now is got, you've got all your speakers back up on screen and we're gonna have um, some questions. Uh, a couple of questions have already been asked in advance, so we'll kick off with those. 
Um, and then if people want to put um, questions into the Q&A box, that would be, would be great. So let us kick off. This is a question I think, um, let's do, Graham, let's start with you. Um, so what new treatments are currently being developed or will av be available over the next few years? So what's that sort of treatment horizon over the next few years? Uh, I'm sure Martin will want to comment as well, because he, I, I, I would definitely agree with him about personalised medicine. And, and as, as we both said, it's not really a competition. Both things are very important. There are some really uh, impressive new therapies that are coming around the corner. First of all, we have CAR T cell therapy, uh, which has already made a big difference for our patients with lymphoma. Uh, and the Marsden where Martin works in Newcastle, where I work, we're doing a lot of CAR T cell transplants in lymphoma patients, and it's been transformative. And I think we both hope that, that we will see CAR T cell therapy available in the United Kingdom within the next 12 months. As well as CAR T cells, though, there are other ways of really exciting the immune system to eradicate multiple myeloma. And we're really moving away from conventional chemotherapy to involving the immune system, the patient's own immune system in getting rid of the myeloma. And these are called T-cell engagers. And basically, they latch onto the myeloma cell. They attract the immune system. The myeloma cell is pretty good at evading the immune system most of the time. So both CAR T-cells and T-cell engagers are a way of really lighting up the plasma cell and telling the immune system these are bad guys. They need to be destroyed. So I think these two therapies in particular are, are going to make a big difference. And fortunately, there are a number of different technologies and a number of different targets, which will mean that I think these will change the landscape of myeloma treatment in the not too distant future. And teclistamab, which is one of these T-cell engagers, has just been approved uh, for use in Europe. Uh, and hopefully we'll see that come to the UK within the next 12 months. So there is a lot of hope. Yeah, no, it sounds very, very positive. M Martin, would you do you want to add anything into that? Uh, I can only fully agree with Graham. I think this is this is exactly he already hits, you know, the 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 big hitters that that are gonna come our way. I think just to add Another perspective that might help actually develop these treatments is as well a development that a number of treatments that we have been using for multiple years now are uh, just becoming uh, coming off patent. So they're becoming more affordable. And, and we are all very hopeful that that means that maybe some of the combination treatments that were just um, currently not accessible because of their prohibitive costs, to be frank, um, might be also something that we might see being being more widely accessible in the future. Uh, because with all the excitement that I share with, with Graham on CAR T-cells and T-cell engages, they are, of course, very, very young treatments still for myeloma. So we, uh, I think we have a really justified, with all the experiences through clinical trials, for example, that you know, both Graham and we are, are participating and we're seeing the fantastic effects, but we're also seeing that maybe they come with different types of side effects. They are milder side effects, often not maybe that visible to the patients. And I think that gives us a lot of hope how they can be used, but but they might have, because they're very mighty immune uh, system modulators, they might have a, a bigger impact on the immune system and immune defenses. And we need to still learn um, uh, uh, how to how to how to really best treat the patients with these drugs as as they have actually entered practice it, it globally and hopefully are to enter the UK uh, practice very soon uh, at lightning speed. I mean, we we I I can remember. I mean, Graham, you will, will remember as well. There was a talk about CAR T cells. It, it doesn't feel that long ago when they showed the very first results, and now we're already talking about having them. Uh, uh, coming into standard care but there is still that that means that quick development means also we still have to learn things about them uh, and and it is can only be a good sign if other types of treatments hopefully are not forgotten over this and also are getting more accessible yeah um 
Karen raised a question saying, talking about vaccine technology. Is there anything in vaccine technologies that could apply to myeloma treatment? Either of you like to answer that? I think she's thinking possibly about COVID mRNA vaccines. I, I certainly think that COVID mRNA vaccines have been an amazing scientific breakthrough and there is the possibility to use that technology in other ways i think that's a little bit of behind um and actually car t cells and t cell engagers and i completely agree with everything martin said he, he's right about the early nature of those treatments but they are almost ways of bypassing a vaccine a vaccine involves the immune system in attacking the myeloma cell and CAR T's and T cell engagers really do the job that a vaccine would do. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so moving on to think a little bit about um, early diagnosis bit, I think Graham, you mentioned the, the I-STOP trial. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that, what the outputs of it are and what it's telling us? Yeah, so uh, the so I-STOP, yeah. Yeah, the iStock trial is an amazing study. Trying, They really have looked at thousands, tens and thousands of people across Iceland and screened them for paraproteins and then divided them up into people they watch and people they investigate a bit further. And, and, and they found a lot of patients with myeloma who didn't know they had it. I, I, I also want to come back to a common theme about quality of life. We know patients' quality of life is critically important. And if we can get patients to diagnosis without bone disease, we are much better at preventing bone disease once we know a patient has myeloma. Whereas if a patient comes to us with bone problems, they're much harder to reverse. So for me, early diagnosis is about improving patients' quality of life. And, and I think we will learn from iStop how to target screening so we really get patients who haven't got bone disease and therefore with the treatments we have are never going to get bone disease and therefore we'll have a better quality of life and benefit from all of the therapies that people like martin are developing i i think if i can just you know uh back up you know what graham says yeah i think the eye stop study is is really fantastic i think it's down to that iceland just has had into into epidemiological research they knew very well their population and they can do a lot of things now with this data i think what is still outstanding of course is the verdict and that will be an answer of the study that they're doing whether screening effectively asking everyone who is over the age of 40 to give a blood sample you know every healthy person uh, is positive or negative as an impact overall, uh, that's still out, that verdict. We don't know that. But we already see other things happening that come from such systematic research. So, for example, a very pragmatic thing is they published um, what are normal light chain levels in someone that has renal impairments because they suddenly could look at a whole uh, population. And that helps even down to, you know, very practical day-to-day -day question. So even if the result of iStop would show in the end, maybe we shouldn't be screening for the disease because it does more harm for those that you know would never develop myeloma, for example. We will learn so much about yeah. um, what actually how to manage. And I think one of the things they will present at Ash is uh, who maybe to do or who can be spared the bone marrow biopsy at diagnosis because it's so unlikely that they have myeloma anyway. So it could be even the the other side of the spectrum, you're not who to intervene yeah. with, but who, who to just leave alone. Uh, that might be the main outcome from the iStop study. No, that's, that's great. Re really, really interesting. And I guess all of that, as we think about sort of different treatments coming through, raises the question that a, a lot of people have sort of been asking, which is, you know, what is what is a cure? What 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 does that mean? How, how long might a remission be that one would call that a cure? So I guess Martin, going back to you first, and then on to, to on to Graham. Sort of, what are your reflections on what what a cure might actually mean for myeloma patients? Yeah, I, I think ultimately, of course, it will come back to every individual. Every individual is different, and will have a different perception of what cure is. There is, of course, for us, uh, there have been different concepts that have been developed. the The ideal concept being that one gives a short term treatment, and after that. Uh, someone just never needs treatment anymore and probably after several years 
doesn't even need to see a specialist doctor anymore, an oncologist anymore. That's the ideal version. I think this is something where we're still unfortunately off in myeloma or, or where we are not yet. It's what we're hoping and aspiring to, but the treatments that we have at the moment, um, the disease still seems to have the ability to, to regrow after that. But we, having said that, another definition of cure is actually that with such effective treatment, uh, someone actually um, still has a life expectancy as they would have um, without the disease. Um, and that's actually, I think, of course, for, you know, someone who, who wants to lead as much a normal life, even with ha having this disease, uh, still a very useful definition. And I think uh, I would be hopeful that we're already reaching that or are going to reach that was some of the newer treatments that we're having coming on. So it will mean that you people can probably not stop treatment, but with some form of, be it intermittent or continuous therapy, we'll have uh, many years to live. But unfortunately, it will also still be the other end of the spectrum. Everyone will be different, uh, and, and that needs attention as well. Uh, I think these are the commonest ways of how to define a cure. And I think if you take the second definition, there's definitely realistic hope that we're getting to something like this yeah. for myeloma it will be something a big question will these treatments be available will they be affordable by the system etc and i think that's where we need to work together very very closely to um to 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 enable that to have for people to have access to these medicines yeah Graham, very briefly, because I've realised that Sheila's sitting there and I have yeah. to bring her in. Have you it cure? Yeah, what does it mean for you, Graham? She's probably got much, <laughs> many more important things to say than I have. I, I've got two things to say. First of all, uh, for those of you who don't know, Martin has done some very inspirational, world-leading research on patients who have the highest risk disease and the poorest outlook. So he's really trying to change the patients with the most aggressive disease into patients who will do better. And I did see a question in the chat about we don't actually sometimes pay enough attention to patients who stay in remission for long periods of time and study them to understand why they do so well. But I'm sure Martin will agree that we now have patients in our clinic that have been going with myeloma 10, 20 and even 25 years now. Uh, so you can't necessarily call them cured, but they are living for decades with this disease. And that is the thing we will see before we see a cure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rowan. Those, those reflections were really, yeah, re I think really helpful for people. So Sheila, I've been sitting there very, very patiently. So um, drug approvals. And this is, you know, you saw in that first poll that, that access to treatment is, has been a, a major kind of focus the last 25 years for people. Um, so what, um, are there any alternatives to the NICE approval process? What are they? What do you see as the, the future of, of access? I think the answer is yes, in principle, Sophie. They've yet to be tested. But as I was saying at the outset, we are at a pivotal moment in treatment and care. And I think now is exactly the time that an organisation like Myeloma UK should be exploring some of these alternatives particularly say for smaller patient populations like patients who have high risk disease. Genuinely one of the most important pieces of work that we do my, at Myeloma UK is advocate for new treatments to be approved by NICE because for those who don't know, treatments are giving a license, are, are given a license which tells you they're safe and effective, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will be prescribed in the NHS. We are the only organization in the UK that works across every single treatment appraisal in myeloma. And that gives us an absolutely unique perspective. And the other thing that is unique about our contribution is that we are a, a channel for the patient voice. So patients will tell us what treatments they need and want. They tell us what side effects they don't want, what side effects are tolerable and I mean, we can see tonight the kind of expertise that people like Graham and Martin have, and we are incredibly fortunate in Myeloma UK to have such close ties with the clinical community. And so every treatment appraisal that comes through, I will talk to people like Graham and Martin. I talk to the company. We talk to NICE. We are really working in every part of the system for that to happen. Um, 
but something I, I actually, sorry, I can't resist it because the chat has been so fascinating tonight. I wanted to pick up on a, on a couple of things that have been said in the chat. And one observation I had was I am constantly struck by the generosity of spirit of myeloma patients. And I think you can really see it in their focus on early diagnosis. Because unfortunately, of course, for a lot of people who are already diagnosed, improvements to early diagnosis are not necessarily going to help their situation. But we saw in our Life Worth Living report about the impact of delayed diagnosis that far too many patients struggle to be diagnosed and they want to share that experience and they want something good to come of it. And that is where Myeloma UK comes in. We can gather that experience and we can campaign for change, but we absolutely can't do it. Um, we can't do it without uh, that input from patients. And it also struck me on many comments in the chat I'm glad to say that we are already in Myeloma UK working in those areas. So someone asked about GP education. We have a GP diagnostic tool. We go to GP conferences. We are developing a lab best practice standard to make sure that when GPs send away for blood test results, they are given every support in making the right kind of diagnosis. We are funding two early diagnosis projects. One looking at um, MGUF, one looking at smouldering myeloma. We have a separate project, which is gathering lots of data from primary care. So I really think I'm, I'm pleased to hear from the chat that I think we are already hitting a lot of the key concerns that patients have. But next year, I want to finish on a plug. Next year, we are doing a really big piece of research looking at unmet need in myeloma, where we will be coming to the patient community. And actually, the survey for this will be coming out, drum roll, in a week or so. And I really would encourage everyone to complete it because that's how we understand what patients need and want, what the big challenges are and where the gaps are. So I think we're doing a lot right already. But I think our Unmet Need project is hopefully going to help us understand even better what it is that patients need and want. Um, thank, thank you, Sheila. That's, and that's a great plug. It's a very important piece of work. So I would encourage people to, to get involved uh, when, they, when they get the email. So we are now running out of time. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. I hope we've conveyed to you that we are, I think, at a real pivot point. You know, we know that people are living longer with myeloma, but we still know that there are people who have very aggressive forms of the disease. You know, we need to be diagnosing it more early, but we also need to be looking at kinder and, and better treatments. And I hope that we've really given you a sense of uh, the possibilities and what's going to be coming up over the next uh, couple of years. Um, if your question wasn't answered here tonight or if you need support, remember, we're always here for you. Um, we have a free info line service, which is available on 0800 980 3332. I think I got that one right. And um, obviously that we have an Ask the Nurse service via our website. So um, please, please do get in touch. Um, this evening's been the start of a really exciting conversation for us about what that future is. Um, we will be doing a bit of a strategy refresh process next year. Um, and there will be lots of opportunities to get involved, tell us more about what's important to you as the myeloma community and, and what we can do, given all of that future potential that Graham and Martin have been talking us about, to us about. And finally, just want to say, obviously, we are none of what we've achieved will be possible without you. We are so grateful for your involvement, your donations. Um, everything that's been achieved over the last 25 years wouldn't have been possible without you. Um, you know, we are very aware of the current cost of living crisis and it's impacting everybody. But if you would want to consider um, giving to our Christmas appeal, um, then please do consider doing that. Um, we've got some generous donors who are match funding the appeal this year. Um, so everything that you give will, will be matched, uh, which means that your, your money will go further. Um, and, you know, if you've been inspired by what you've heard tonight, then I think the link for that Christmas appeal will be in the, will be in the chat. Um, but together we can do more for myeloma patients in the future. And I really do hope that this evening's expert panel has really inspired you with what that future can be. So thank you again. Thank you for joining us and good night from all of us here at Myeloma UK. Bye. Bye. Bye.